You're listening to the Visible Expert Podcast, where we share stories, research, and actionable insights to help B2B marketers and practitioners drive extraordinary growth in their professional lives. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Visible Expert Podcast. I'm John Tyerman. And as always, I'm Kelly Waffle. And today we talked with Mike Schultz from The Rain Group, and he is, The Rain Group is a B2B sales coaching organization, sales training organization, and um, they help uh, B2B sales practitioners um, get in the mindset of selling professional services and B2B services and so forth. So it was really great to catch up with Mike. Yeah, it really was. So uh, from a visible expert perspective, Mike has had quite an interesting life. Uh, both from a business point of view and a personal point of view. Uh, You'll really want to listen to this podcast today. Yeah, we talked about um, a lot of the, you know, how to get into a sales mindset as an organization. What are some of the metrics that you should be keying in on? um, And what some of the top performers do differently than other sales professionals in the B2B space? Um, but his, uh, but one thing that I did want to mention is that he um, talked about his his story with his son Ari, and um, his. And you can check out that story at echoofhope.org. You'll appreciate what he has to say about that. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a father of two young boys, and I've got one along the way. So, um, hearing that story really was powerful to me. Uh, Kelly, what did you what did you think? Um, uh, about his personal story, I just found it fascinating how he was over oh, abil- uh, his ability to overcome that. So mm-hmm. he talks about literally being in the hospital for thirty days at a time and not focusing on work at all, but really focusing on his son. And then uh, he he had some other uh, tragedies happen in his life as well around the same time that he had to overcome and and still um, grow his business. So. Um, really interesting story about how to, to overcome a lot of that stuff, how to deal with it, how to persevere, and, and it, it was really an engaging conversation with Mike. Um, I really liked what he was saying around the, the sales mindset. Um, uh, too many organizations out there don't have that sales mindset, and from Mike's perspective, it really comes down to leadership and, and creating that culture uh, as Mike talks about, and this refers back to a joke that he tells, is really around um, how many light bulbs are willing to change. And um, you'll get it when you hear his joke, but uh, he really asks a really pointed question about what would it really take to create a sales culture here? Mm-hmm. And he really recommends that uh, everyone have an open discussion about it uh, and put everything out on the table and he says that that will really help avoid a lot of the false starts uh, that a lot of organizations have. And then as you were touching on earlier, he, um, uh, you know, really gets into, you know, you can't just go out and hire salespeople and expect that suddenly you're going to go out and hit all these quotas. It requires a lot of coaching. You have to have the right tools and resources. you got to have the right compensation package in place. So all of these things tie together for sales success and performance. All right, so this episode is sponsored by the Hinge Research Institute. If you are involved in marketing demand or lead generation and want to use a data-driven content strategy, consider using original research. The Hinge Research Institute offers a range of services from tiered sponsorships of original studies to custom research on specific industry challenges. We found that high-growth professional services firms are three times more likely than no-growth firms to use original research in their content strategy. And, according to Forbes, Companies who adopt a data-driven marketing approach are six times more likely to be profitable year over year. If you're interested in learning more, email us at research at hingemarketing.com and we'll find the right approach to using original research for you. All right. Any other thoughts before we jump into the interview? No, uh, I think it's a great one and and, uh, looking forward to hearing people's thoughts on it. All right. Well, here comes Mike. I'm pleased to announce this week's guest. He's the president of Rain Group, a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and keynote speaker. Mike Schultz, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me, guys. It's great to be here. 
Absolutely. Hey, Mike, I was surprised to learn that you're a big fan of the Grateful Dead. Did, did you at one point consider yourself a deadhead? I would have considered myself a deadhead if they allowed kids my age into the dead concerts when they were really sort of big with the deadhead tours. I went to my first shows in 94. I went to three shows at the Garden. I was in college. I don't know if I was a deadhead quite yet because I was just getting introduced. Uh, but I almost went to Dead and Company last week or two weeks ago when they were in the Boston area. And I had four floor seats. I ended up giving them up on the day of the show. So oh, I guess you could say I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan, but uh, sometimes the shows just don't work out. They like to do those collaborative shows with other artists. Do, were they playing with anybody in particular? Well, if I was able to show up, I would have answered that question yeah. very well. <laughs> but uh, since I wasn't there, no, they were just playing uh, as dead in company. But I have to say, for all of your hundreds of millions of listeners out there, especially on the continent of Antarctica, <laughs> everyone should listen to J J Rad, which is Joe Russo's Almost Dead. They're probably the best uh, best Grateful Dead cover band I've I've heard I've heard ever. They're awesome. Very cool. I I just wrote wrote that down, so I'll have to go check them out. I'm a music junkie myself, so and I like the Dead, so I'll I'll check them out. Um, here at Hinge, uh, we define influencers in the B2B space as visible experts. So uh, our pa- podcast is focused on sharing the stories of our guests and really illuminating their journey to building a personal brand. Can you spend a few minutes uh, talking about your journey to becoming a visible expert? Uh, Sure. Well, it all started when I was five, and I first read In Search of Excellence (laughs) right at that time. So uh, I um, I was working at a leadership development company, and we were paying something like $50,000, $80,000 for speakers uh, who at the time in the 90s had literally all they did was wrote a few books back in the time when when that would absolutely positively put you on the map like crazy man. Uh, And I thought, wow, that was pretty cool. And we were at this company. It was a global company. And literally at the time, nobody wrote an article. Nobody wrote an article. Nobody did a research report. Nobody wrote a white paper. We had a bunch of printed brochures in a side cube. Um, Literally, this was a global leadership development company. So there wasn't really that much to go on. Um, When John Doerr and I started started Rain Group, we said, well, we're going to have to make a name for ourselves. And it was just John and me, two laptops and the dog. Uh, The dog wasn't going to help with intellectual capital, but the two laptops could. So we started a newsletter and we said we are going to, uh, especially for our moms and cousins, who were the first people that were on the newsletter at the time, this was back in 2002, we're going to publish at least one article a month. Looking back, I'd love to say that they were awesome. They were at least clear, but they were pretty boring. Uh, but the the practice of writing gets you writing. Uh, and next thing you know, we've written four books, one bestseller, seven languages, uh, 30 white papers. Uh, we're in the middle of another book, 15 major benchmark research reports, some in conjunction with him uh, with Hinge. Uh, over 600 articles, um, just it, it just sort of happens. But we, we, I was literally sitting there building a website on Microsoft Publisher saying, hey, I can put blog posts up. A blog is a thing that is a web blog, and you can literally you know, just post articles on the web. And I was sitting there in my pajamas, and we, we posted the first one. And next thing you know, um, 17 years later, old Jed's a millionaire. <laughs> Mike, you mentioned um, uh, doing doing some of that original research, and uh, you know, you, the Rain Group does research on topics like what sales winners do differently and how to become extremely productive. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about um, the impact that doing that kind of original research might have on your company's marketing and and your sales? Sure. Well, you can't get a column in Entrepreneur Magazine without things like that unless you want to buy it, and we haven't bought it. I'm not saying that Entrepreneur sells them, but it gets you good press. It got us in Fast Company. It helped us make our books uh, bestsellers. The bestsellers help you get speeches. The books and the speeches help you get help you get um, clients. Uh, but as well, from one of the research reports 
before we wrote Insight Selling the Book, you mentioned what sales winners do differently. We wrote a white paper called What Sales Winners Do Differently, which was the first thing that came out of the research. A couple of guys in Australia uh, wrote that, read that research going on five years ago, and they said, hey, do you guys want representation in Australia? Next thing I knew, I was spending my 40th birthday on, on Sydney Harbor with these two with these two young young entrepreneurs who um, had history in executive education and thought, hey, maybe we'll represent Rain Group uh, in the sales sales training business. Next thing you know, they have uh, large global companies. They're absolutely fabulous. They have a multi-million dollar practice. And they were at my house two weeks ago for the Rain Group third international conference at my house at seven o'clock in the morning uh, going wakeboarding. I, I live on a lake. We went wakeboarding, we played pickleball, and by nine o'clock, we were literally on the back porch having coffee and um, strategizing for continuing to take over the world. That all came from research. Research came white papers and books, and literally, that's how you end up with your Australian office. Who knew? (laughs) So you're saying that if we continue to publish original research, we can uh, start our own pickleball team? Go to Australia. Yeah, <laughs> you can start your you, you 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 indeed might have a chance of making the Antarctic beach volleyball team. Yes, indeed. Ah, uh, great. That's our goal. That is our goal because <laughs> then we'll be on all seven continents. That's right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's good. So yeah, we look for a lot of tips in these podcasts. So that's a that's a good one. Thank you, Mike. What do you think, Mike, is the biggest challenge for organizations to a, adopt a sales mindset? Oh, there you go, switching gears. I thought you were going <laughs> to be, become visible experts. Let me answer the question I thought you were going to ask with our with our Vulcan mind meld over here. I wanted to say one thing about content. Uh-huh. Uh, back in back in the day, you could write a book and become famous. Next thing you know, you're giving eighty thousand dollars speeches for um, for a leadership development company. Now you could literally write a book, and if a someone an author writes a book and it falls in the woods, does anyone hear it? Uh, sometimes no now, and so there's just a lot more noise. I would say a lot of people are on the 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 let's become uh, content marketers and publishers bandwagon, and the stuff is awful, mm-hmm. and I mean it's awful. And seven or eight years ago, I would say it was awful to say if you want to be noticed, if you want this to make a dent, if you want it to be good. It has to be good. Now I'd say a lot of it is awful, but a lot of it is good. It has to really be breathtaking for you to break in with content marketing. It's just super hard right now. Um, But if you're thinking, oh boy, I can write. If you did what we did in 2002, it wouldn't even make a dent because I thought our stuff was good but boring. Good but boring doesn't cut cut it anymore. It has to be exceptionally good for you to be a good uh, content, content writer, content marketer. Uh, and to get known for intellectual property. And you asked a question about sales. I'd be happy to uh, to answer that again once um, once my old brain remembers what the question was. What was the question? How do you develop a, a culture of sales success? Yeah, so what do you think is the biggest challenge for organizations to adopt a, a sales mindset? Well, um, let's see. Uh, do you guys know, know how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> I don't know how many. One, but the well, one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Ah, so <laughs> this has to be both culturally from the organization, or it also has to come from leadership. Um, if you say we're going to compete on sales, and you really don't mean it, and nothing's going to happen. You could sink tons of money. You could buy things from us. Uh, you could hire whiz bang folks. It's just not going to happen if leadership isn't really behind it. Now, I know that Hinge focuses, uh, or at least is a deep expert in the world of professional services. This is going to be very different for developing a mindset of business development or sales. I can't really say sales because the law firm would say, we don't do sales. We do business development. We do client development. Yeah, well, you do sales. But uh, it's very different in, say, a professional services firm, consulting, accounting, law, technology services, than it is, say, in um, a SaaS company where you can either sell or die if you're in other kinds of companies where if you don't sell uh, and sell really well, you're absolutely positively going nowhere. Uh, But let's say professional services, you have to mean it. 
And I would say, figure out which light bulbs we're willing to change. My guess is, is if you have 100 people that are at the age where they could sell and are at the professional career stage where they could sell, but they're just not selling, find out who's willing to do it. The ones that aren't willing to do it, figure out a path for them where they don't have to sell. This doesn't have to be anything negative. It might be something like, oh, wow, you're a fabulous engineer and you make, say, $100,000 to pick a round number. And you've been here for quite some time, you make $100,000. If you want to be a partner, you can make three hundred. dollars if you want to be a fully billable, awesome engineer, you're going to make 100, maybe 105, maybe 110. But I'm not going to make you sell, but you can't make the kind of money that you would make unless you become a partner, a leader, bring in business, develop a practice. Now, each one of them can be a very positive path, but don't twist someone's arm and say, you have to sell, because then it turns into these, well, they've made me come to sales training for seven years, and they keep telling me to do it, but they haven't fired me yet, and I don't want to. But I don't say that, because our culture doesn't allow for actual conversations about this. Well, you should have conversations about it, figure out who's willing to do it, and then figure out an actual strategy. You can ask one question and answer it well. You will be fine. If you don't ask this question and don't seek the answer, you're toast. The answer is, what would it really take to develop a culture of sales success here? If you can answer that question, it might mean changing some people. It might mean changing your structure. It might mean changing your compensation. It might mean a sales university where you have a five-year path to becoming really good at sales. It might mean hiring some different people or bringing in people that can set meetings. It might mean all sorts of different things. But you have to ask the question, have an open discussion with at least some experts to say, what will it really take? If you answer that question well, uh, then you could avoid a false start. You could avoid losing hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions of dollars. And you can actually drive revenue faster than having two, let's call them, year and a half to two years failures before you realize you're going to have to, you're going to have to try to um, get off the, get off the dime in a different way. Okay. So it sounds like it's really a cultural mindset shift and it's also dependent upon the individual. Yeah, sure. So, well, it's dependent upon the individual. You just can't make someone sell that doesn't want to sell. But what's going to happen is, is you'll have a bell curve. You have 100 people that are of the age that they could sell. You might have 15, 20 people that say, over my dead body, no matter what you can do, <laughs> either I won't sell or no matter what, I absolutely positively have no chance of having any half decent sell at, skill at selling. Even if you invested 10 years and millions of dollars in me, I'm still going to suck at it. That's probably 10, 20%. Mm -hmm. Probably have... 5, 10, maybe 15% that are natural. They're either good or very good, just with a little bit of coaching and watching some of the people that bring in business now. Uh, they have a little bit of fearlessness. They're willing to go up and give it a try. And next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. But you're going to have 60 or 7% in the middle that says, give me some guidance. Give me some coaching. Help me learn what I need to do. Help me paint by numbers so I can build a plan of what I'm supposed to do on the days that I'm not doing other work. What am I supposed to be doing? I can't invent a networking event at 10 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon when I have gaps in my schedule on a Tuesday. So if I don't have that networking event, what should I do? They end mm -hmm. up pushing papers, sending emails, uh, updating their LinkedIn profile. Not good enough. You can literally create a completely different world for yourself as a professional. If we're talking professionals, in about you know year and a half to two years, sometimes two and a half years, you can absolutely positively change your professional fortunes if you know what to do and you're willing to do it. If you're not willing to do it or you don't know what to do, you can keep updating your LinkedIn profile. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> so that 60 or 70% in the middle, they need guidance. They need to know how to paint by numbers. They need coaching. They need to be pushed. They need to be challenged. But they're the ones that say, I'm willing to give it a shot, then they probably give it a shot. Um, but then you need to ask yourself, do they have the right expectations? Yes. If they know what to do, great. Do they actually have um, the skills and knowledge? If they don't have the skills and knowledge, they won't be able to do it. Do they have the right coaching? Do they have the right motivation, compensation? Do they have the right tools and resources? Hey, I want to create 20 meetings. Who should I meet with? Oh, great. We have this awesome database with updated names. And I have people that I can email and I have a campaign that I can use to get in touch with them. Or they might have absolutely nothing, just them and Google. So, And, and probably everywhere in between. So there are a variety of things that you need to set up for the sales performance environment to allow for sales success. Um, but the things, if, if I were to boil it down, is to say, 
make sure they have the right expectations. Make sure they you know what skills they need and get them the skills to do it and get them a coach to help them figure out what actions to take, when they should take them, help them stay accountable, do it in a positive way, and drive to an actual goal. If you can get those three things in place uh, with someone that's willing to do it, you should be in pretty good shape. Yeah, and uh, what's what's your, your take on how analytics comes into the picture, you know, for B2B and professional services firms who maybe they want to get started with sales forecasting um, and want to develop business on a more repeatable interval. So what, what sort of metrics or analytics would you recommend they get started with? Yeah. Um, the first thing that I would say is don't start with the analytics, start with what you're trying to accomplish and achieve because the analytics might be, Oh, look, we are at, a, now, are we talking mostly professional services firms? Or are we talking um, technology firms or some or places that need to have sophisticated sales enablement environments? Which one do you want me to talk to? Yeah, let's let's speak to our audience is primarily professional services firms. So let's let's speak to that. Yeah, sure. So it's going to be very different in terms of analytics. You say we have 420 people across six offices. We have. Um, 22 proposals a week. Our win rate on um, proposed business is 35%. Hey guys, do you know what the win rate of top performing organizations is on proposed sales? Not off the top according of my to our head. Research, it's six, according to our research, it's 62%. And the average of the rest, which is 80% of the businesses out there, the average of the rest, of which, by the way, professional services firms are not different than most other companies, uh, is about 40%. The difference between a 40% win rate on proposed sales and 62% is a massive difference in growth and margin for the business. It's literally like sending out proposals. You send out 100. Imagine winning 62 versus 40. That's usually a massive shot, shot in the arm of revenue and high profitable revenue because you're already paying for the staff. You're just winning more. So is the analytics that we need to improve our win rate on proposed sales? Is the analytics that we need to create 22 new meetings a week across our team so we can then move people through the pipeline? Uh, is our analytics growth on uh, existing accounts? We worked with a large engineering firm that had named accounts. Of their named accounts, uh, their growth rate was something like 11%. And their growth rate of all of their accounts was 4%. When we started working with them on plans to grow those named accounts, we had named account growth that was literally over 100%. Now, their, their accounts were usually in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. They had a $200,000 account. And they said, there should be $2 million worth of business here. But they had no idea how to go after it. But of those named accounts, they started to be more like four or $500,000 on average. They actually had more than 100% growth. They just didn't know what to do. So I would say focus on what your outcome desires are and then decide what metrics you need. Once you can do that, you can do the analysis that gets the metrics. Some of the advanced things, like using artificial intelligence to measure phone calls and then do analytics on your top performers of what they're actually doing in their calls versus the rest, uh, I would probably leave that to the advanced tech firms because that, that stuff is all kind of wonky right now anyway. Um, until that actually becomes a part of the mainstream, I wouldn't go down that path. For most companies, it's literally figuring out pipeline, velocity of pipeline, average size of opportunity, win rate on proposed sales, um, size of account, um, satisfaction, retention year after year, all those kinds of good things. Very good. Oh, you know what? I'll even give you a, re a resource. Google essential sales metrics rain group and you'll find a an infographic of sales metrics you can literally scan it and that'll help you figure out which ones are important to us or not and from there you can figure out how to measure hey mike let's uh change it up a little bit here um i saw that last year the uh, american heart association of central massachusetts uh, gave you the heart of gold award can you talk a little bit about your passion for raising awareness about uh, congenital heart defects? Uh, sure. So um, let's see. 
About seven years ago, uh, in September of 2011, my wife, Erica, and I uh, went in for our 18-week ultrasound when we were pregnant with our first child. We were super excited to find out whether or not we were having a boy or a girl. And in the same breath that we found out we were having a boy, we also found out that he had critical aortic stenosis and evolving hypoplastic left heart. So for those of you who aren't cardiologists, I certainly had no idea what that meant. It essentially meant his heart was really sick and he needed some serious surgeries and support to to help him survive. He was then the first person in the world ever to have two successful heart surgeries before he was born. Uh, After he was born, he had some major open heart surgery. He spent about seven months in the hospital. Uh, And for most of his life, he lived a pretty healthy life. Uh, until he was about five years old and needed a heart transplant uh, that unfortunately he and his new heart did not get along. Um, And he passed away uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, going on two years ago now. Uh, But we spent a good seven years of our life uh, where for my wife and me, our, our sort of primary purpose in life was to give him the best life that he could possibly have. And a lot of that was fighting a hot war deep in the trenches at Boston Children's Hospital uh, with the world of congenital heart defects. Now, there's a lot of money that's raised for uh, heart disease. Heart disease is number one killer of, I think, everyone. Uh, And a lot of money goes there. But there's no money in congenital heart defects for... Uh, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, uh, and even doctors and hospitals because it's very, very specialized, small populations. And so uh, my son's surgeon was literally like MacGyver in the operating room saying, well, we can do this for adults, but they literally don't make valves that big. So I took another thing, I snipped it in half, I turned it upside, turned it upside down, tried to shove it in to see if it could work. And my wife and I just think uh, we need to do better than that for these kids. Uh, my son was my best friend. He was my sidekick, and he was probably the most magnetic person uh, I've ever met. Um, and I, w- I wish that he was—I wish that he was still here. So all we can do is is help some other family and some other kid to get medicine and uh, medical devices and care for these kids to be better. So in the future, uh, more kids that are that are magnetic uh, can make their impact on the world uh, than the, the short five years that that we had with our son. Mike, that really hit home. I've got um, I've got a three year old boy and a one year old boy at home too. So I totally resonate with that. Well, thanks. If, uh, if anyone wants to read a little bit of our journey with our son, um, I, I haven't written on his blog for a couple of years. I wrote him a, essentially a, a, a goodbye letter. Uh, he only made it to five, but I wrote him a letter on his 10th birthday. That's uh, on his blog at echoofhope.org. Um, but you'll also see in echo, E-C-H-O-O-F-H-O-P-E dot org. Uh, but if you scan around, you'll also see what I mean about his magnetism. I mean, he was on ABC World News tonight because he was drafted on a college baseball team when he turned four because he was that big of a baseball fan. He made friends with Brad Stevens, who's the coach of the Celtics, somehow found himself on the floor of the Celtics during Celtics playoff games. Um, Probably 200 million people saw videos of him when he was at the hospital just because um, when we told him about him getting a heart at first and after waiting for 189 days, uh, actually 220 or so days, and then when he was going to go home about 189 days after getting his heart, being really sick in the process, he just had some hilarious things to say, and you know, um, he was just a just a fun kid. That's great. So that was uh, echoofhope.com. So I, I hope a lot of our listeners dot, will go. Dot dot org dot org sorry dot about org. that um okay. so if, if people want to find out more information about 
this condition or how they can help out, uh, what would you recommend to them, Mike? Uh, sure. Uh, so there's tons of ways you, you can help out. Um, but I would say for this for this podcast, for your listeners, everyone check out the Ethan Lindbergh Foundation, just like it sounds, Ethan Lindbergh Foundation. Uh, they help, they're a very small charity. They help families um, get to and stay uh, in the area at Boston Children's Hospital when their kids need cardiac support. The kind of support that's provided at Boston Children's Hospital, literally the surgeries that he had, they can't do any place else in the world. And about 50% of the cardiac care there is from people outside of New England. And literally, uh, people that we help through this foundation, um, my wife and I ran a charity golf tournament for them, did some other fundraising. We literally met some families. One of them, there were soybean farmers from Louisiana, and there's no way they could have saved their child if they could get up, if they couldn't get up to and stay in Boston. Um, they didn't have the resources for that. And without the Ethan Lindbergh Foundation, they wouldn't have. So you know, I would say check out the Ethan Lindbergh Foundation and make a huge impact on a small charity, one family at a time. This has just been a, um, a great moment in our podcast. So we, we appreciate you uh, opening up and sharing with us like that, Mike. Um, in your bio, it says that you uh, actively study and teach uh, the traditional martial arts of karate and jiu-jitsu. Um, I believe you hold the rank of uh, third-degree black belt and sensei. Is this true? Uh, it is true, uh, and that's something that I would say if there's one thing in my, in my bio that needs to be updated, I would say it's that, and that's because, as you might imagine, I did martial arts for 17 years straight. I had my own dojo at Babson College for 10 years. And you might imagine after having a son like my son, Ari, uh, once we found out he had congenital heart defects, we literally haven't done a thing for ourselves in seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now just essentially getting back on our feet. Um, when, Ari was, when Ari was at the hospital, um, for his long, long wait for his heart. And right around when he got his heart, uh, literally we were in the hospital for something like five months. I hadn't been home for about 30 days because we had an infant at home and I can't breastfeed. So I essentially lived at the hospital next to my son and my wife stayed home. And I went home, it was literally the first time in almost 30 days. And I found a mushroom growing out of my wall. Uh, one thing led to another, led to another. Next thing we know, we had to tear the house down. So in the middle of my son getting a heart and then getting really sick, uh, we had to tear our house down for mold damage. Uh, so we had two other little kids, a three-year-old and an infant. So we were literally tearing our house down where we were also going through this ordeal. Uh, shortly after we learned the house had to come down um, was when my son had his first cardiac arrest after rejecting his new heart. Uh, and literally we were homeless and, 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 and working on this book. We essentially just finished up the house, um, in the last few months and now we're, we're getting back on our feet, but, uh, I did martial arts for a long time. I just haven't done it. I haven't done it for a little while. Well, it's great to hear. And as you might imagine, it hasn't been a priority to update that part of my, <laughs> yeah, of my bio. Yes. Working on other things. Yeah. So, Mike, that's um, it's it's great to hear that you're getting back on your feet. What well, what would you say is um, something that's helped you get through everything that you've you've been going through? Uh, well, I would say uh, the Hinge research and blogs have really just been a great. Just kidding. Uh, you guys are awesome. But uh, I think the probably the thing thing that got me through uh, it was just my wife and and my other two kids. Uh, mm -hmm. my son, Eli, who is wildly different than Ari, Eli's three years old, is just hilarious and fun. And my daughter, Lexi, who is just about to turn six in a couple of days, uh, is just a, a, a ray of sunshine. She's, she's a, a crazy kid. She's a Greek kid. She lives in her own little, like literally on her own planet. And it's just, it's just, um, a, a pleasure and a, a treat to be able to see her every day and wonder what goes on through her crazy mind with the things that she's been imagining for the last hour. So without them and without my wife, who's just amazing um, and uh, an inspiring person, 
you know, I don't know. I don't know how we would have done, but with them and with, um, especially, you know, we, we lost our son, but we lost our house. Nothing could, could, could really be done about losing our son. But when we lost our house, we literally had a neighbor who was in construction say, how can I help? And um, my cousin was at the house saying, well, I don't know, what can you do? And he went to his company and came back and said, we'll rebuild your house. Uh, he managed all of the construction, but he literally gave two years of his life on his own time uh, to manage the process of rebuilding our house. So when things like this happen, um, you just never know what good you're going to see in people. And while we put the, the sirens on the top of our car and ran to the hospital to save Ari, and did the best we could right in the middle of it. <laughs> we found ourselves sinking in a hole ourselves and someone put the siren on to come in and save us. And it's just, you know, none of that's going to happen in life. And it does. So those, those things are pretty inspiring in the midst of, of, of pretty big challenges. Um, I've just got one more question for you, Mike. Uh, what advice would you give a, uh, uh, a professional uh, listening to this podcast who was like looking to build their personal brand? So the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, who do you want to be? Um, and a lot of times people say, well, I want to be the next. And it's some big star. I would say 98% of the people that are trying to emulate someone who is really in the limelight, they just don't have it. You don't have to have that to be wildly successful. There was a book uh, that I saw that was out about 20 years ago that the title always stuck with me. I think it was by a guy named Steven Van Yoder. It said, get slightly famous. And a lot of people, I think, only need to get slightly famous. If you want to be a visible expert, it might be that you're giving uh, presentations in your local market. I knew a guy that was literally like the condo leasing um, and regulations king. He was he was a lawyer that worked with condo associations, and he just said, "That's what I'm going to do." I, I found myself with two of them, so I put together presentations, and I reached out to other associations, and I started to give presentations on the right way to do X, Y, and Z. And on my website, I made you know it was kind of a mess, and he cleaned it up a little bit, and he said that he was going to commit to putting up all of his best tips and not hold anything back. And next thing you know, he had a very, very lucrative practice as the condo king and lawyers, as a lawyer. So there's a lot that you can do to, to become a visible expert. That doesn't necessarily mean publishing books in 22 different languages, mm -hmm. um, having a three quarter of a million dollar. We're a small company, uh, a small company. We, I say that now, but um, you know, we have full time offices. We're in the Boston area for our headquarters. We have offices in. Geneva, London, Mumbai, Sydney, Johannesburg, Toronto, Bogota, and Seoul. Um, but not everyone, even in small businesses, are willing to put together, you know, seven-figure development apparatus for intellectual capital research and marketing um, like we do. But you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, you just have to figure out who do you want to be and then go after that. The other thing is, is find quality. There's so much junk out there, and I would say the bar has been raised an exceptional amount in, in quality, and that if literally, if you don't know what quality is, find someone who knows what quality is and help them set up what those guidelines should be for you, and just make sure you do that. Otherwise, you're going to spend three years writing things and giving presentations, and nobody's going to care. That's the last thing you want. You could create quality content and quality thought leadership and perspective by um, publishing that original research, and that's what we kind of talked about um, earlier. Is there anything on the horizon for you, Mike, and, and Rain Group, and what's the next piece of research you guys are going after? Uh, well, we have one thing that we just finished that's going that's been um, kind of struck a nerve, and we're going to write a book on it. Uh, we have one project we're in the middle of, and then we have the next one coming up. So. The one that struck a nerve that we're going to be writing a book on um, is about productivity. We, as a matter of fact, now that I told the story, I don't usually tell this, but um, when we were in the hospital, um, we named Rain Group in 2011. We got pregnant with Ari in 2011, and I had a startup to try to keep together while I also lived at the hospital. Now, if Ari was really sick, I didn't do any work. 
uh, regardless of what was going on. Um, but there were times when, you know, after surgery where he was resting comfortably, but he was, you know, sedated. I literally sat by the bedside for 14 hours and did nothing. And my wife said, if you're doing nothing and you want to take your mind off it, you can work. It's okay. So if he was fine, but, you know, relaxing and trying to get better, I sat there and worked, but I literally, I was working in the middle of a war zone. So at that time I started to really uh, just research how do you work in conditions like this when there's so much distraction? And when I used to sit at my desk with no kids and all the time in the world, I could spend all the time I wanted. I could do this. I could do that. I could get some productive stuff done. I could move along. But when I literally had this much time and if I didn't do it, my whole family was going to be out of healthcare and it wasn't a good idea to be out of healthcare in the minute at that, that time. And so I had to make sure I was only doing the most important things exceptionally well, very productive while I was doing it in an undistractable in a war zone. So that's how we started to develop the system. Next thing you know, we're rolling it out with clients, we're rolling it out with clients globally. Next thing you know, we have just shy of 3,000 um, pieces of uh, you know, survey research on 3,000 different people on their work habits. We do regression analysis and find out what the what the key drivers of productivity are we refine the system and now we literally know a lot of people say oh i have this hack and that hack because it helped me well i know across thousands of people across continents what actually makes them productive and the interesting things that these productivity behaviors are very learnable uh, so you can sort of sift through the noise and learn what we call the nine habits of extreme productivity uh, and the people that do that, their, their productivity goes up, their performance against peers is much higher. And literally one of the things we want to look at is how do you create productivity that doesn't make you just feel completely drained, like all you're doing is working. So we wanted to see where productivity and happiness actually cross over to have true mindful and intentional productivity. And we found that. So we're going to turn that into a book. That's the first one. We're in the middle of a project of negotiation. Professional services providers love it when someone says, all right, it's yours, but you got to do it for 7% less. Or it's yours, but there's a sticky situation and we have to work through it. Um, so we're studying uh, hundreds of buyers and hundreds of sellers. We have just shy of 800 total responses and what it's like negotiating with each other. And what is it that buyers do most often and they believe that it works. And what is it that sellers do most often they believe that works? What is it that sellers do that buyers find annoying? All this good stuff. We're going to have all that data and research on negotiation. And then after that, we're going to study what the best practices in sales coaching are and what makes for a top performing sales coach. That's what's up in research. We are researching like crazy. This <laughs> it sounds like it, it does. I'm looking forward to downloading those studies and, uh, and learning what you, what, what, what you've done with this research. So looking forward to that. For sure. Well, thanks. Well, Mike, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on our show today. Uh, um, you know, and thank you for sharing, sharing your story. Um, if folks want to get in touch with you, where, where should they go to, to learn more? Uh, if folks want to get in touch with me, um, hop on to LinkedIn and look up Mike Schultz Train Group. I'm not that hard to find. It's S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. You can also just send me an email directly at mschultz, uh, M-S-C-H-U-L-T-Z at raingroup.com. Just like it sounds, rain like the weather, group like singing group, raingroup.com. Or just go to raingroup.com, find the website. If you hit the contact form, it's going to go to someone on my marketing team and they'll say, hey, Mike, this one was for you. So I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show. Yeah. I, well, thanks I, so much for having me, guys. It was a very uh, meaningful podcast. So thank you, Mike. Well, thanks again for having me and thanks for letting me, me tell the story and, and to talk about Ari. I do love to talk about him. All right. And that was our chat with Mike Schultz from The Rain Group. So, um, Check out his website, uh, raingroup.com. Also, go to echoofhope.org um, and um, check out his story um, of Ari, his son, and everything that he's gone through on that front. Um, and Mike, after we, we went offline, he also mentioned that there is an ESPN 30-minute special on, um, on Ari and his, 
his story. So if you find yourself in a position um, to go onto YouTube, uh, search for that and um, and t- take take a look. So we also um, we also value your feedback, the listeners. Uh, we we've got um, um, a, a new fan in John Moore. John, if you're listening, give us a shout on social media. It's always good to hear from you. Yeah, uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you thought about this uh, latest interview with Mike Schultz, John. So let us know. And if any of of you have questions that you'd like for Kelly and I to answer, um, submit them to podcast at hingemarketing.com, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, and uh, we'll answer your questions on the show. All right, well, that's uh, that's it for this week's episode of the Visible Expert Podcast. Um, this is John and Kelly signing off. Have a great week. <laughs> <laughs>